Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of orange out there tonight. That is great uh, to see. And we have, uh, um, we have finally given up on CEOs for this season, okay? We've had enough CEOs here. Uh, don't you all agree? You've, see, you've seen enough CEOs? All right. Now, now we're going to have some fun tonight instead. So, um, uh, because, as you can tell from my accent, I'm probably not the best person to do a one-hour interview with these formidable gentlemen. Um, we have enlisted the uh, services of uh, uh, Don Bailey, Jr., who's uh, with us here. And everybody knows Don as, you know, 25-year uh, uh, veteran broadcaster of uh, Hurricanes games and, you know, just a wonderful friend of uh, the U. And uh, we're just uh, really delighted to have you here with us uh, tonight, Don. Thank you for uh, joining. And thank and you very much. If, if I remember rightly, you were with the Colts. Have I got that right? Yes, sir. For two seasons? For two cups of coffee. <laughs> That's two seasons. Okay, that's right. And uh, uh, you, you were um, with Howard, right? Yes, sir. Schellenberger? The yeah. whole time. I was in his first class. Fantastic. Of 1979. Yeah. All right, fine. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions if we have time as well, because that must have been a phenomenal coaching experience uh, uh, to have him as your coach. He was amazing. Right. He's still a part of anybody that came in contact with him, he's, he's a part of your life forever. Right. Uh, so, um, which of you guys should I introduce first? I think, uh, I, think I, I, think I know. <laughs> Mario, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, I last heard you at the uh, Board of Trustees meeting where you just gave a phenomenal presentation. Um, had everybody totally fired up uh, in the promise of what's going to happen under your uh, leadership. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming here, or coming home, I should say, after uh, a journey that took you across the country. And, um, you know, so proud of your uh, victories uh, with Oregon in the uh, PAC conference and uh, also uh, the Rose Bowl, etc. So, fantastic to have you here. Great to be home. Great to be home. Go Kings! <laughs> All right. And, um, you know, f finally in this, uh, in this suite of talent, we have Dan Radakovich, who uh, uh, we're very proud also to have as an alum of uh, Miami Herbert Business School uh, with uh, your MBA from our school. Fantastic. And I hope all of that uh, finance course, all those finance courses are going to be put to good use, right, uh, in uh, your, your current role. Well, I, I, look, Dean, it has been, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to share the stage with Mario and Don and to see so many great hurricanes out there. It's a, this building, when I walked through uh, earlier today, the last time I was, I was here was to have my last final exam in 1982. So it was a <laughs> there was a little bit of a shake going on as I, as I kind of went through here. But it's, uh, it's such an honor to be back here at the University of Miami. And right. Great things are going to happen. Um, um, by, by the way, you know, these buildings uh, have stood the test of time pretty well. And uh, thanks to uh, Blanker, I'm not sure if I see Blanker here, but Blanker Rapol and our facilities team keep these facilities spotless even though they are decades old. And uh, we really owe them a great, uh, a great um, vote of gratitude for maintaining these buildings, which, by the way, are all LWED certified for operations and maintenance, which you may not, not know. But that's very important to us as well. So um, you've come back to us from uh, Clemson, uh, having previously been at uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, I know that in terms of building facilities, you've done that. You've raised funds, uh, and so this combination is going to be uh, absolutely phenomenal, and we, we appreciate give, it so much. I'm going to give everybody the biggest secret to raising funds and building buildings. Okay? Are you ready? Get your pencil out. <laughs> it's guys like this. Exactly. Right here. Exactly. <laughs> the football, the football <laughs> runs it, and, and we're able to just make it a little bit better. But, you know, that, that's... The, with Mario here, I think there's a, a real opportunity for us to transform 
you know, where Miami is now to where it needs to be. All right. So looking forward to that. So before I hand over to Don, there's one, being a, being a slightly quantitative guy, there's one interesting uh, uh, comparative statistic I want to share with you, and that is that um, Mario is the 26th head coach of the Miami, Miami Hurricanes, right? And Dan is the 14th director of athletics. So, what does that tell you about the comparative longevity of uh, <laughs> folks in these positions? Uh, Dan, do you want to comment on that? That's a historical statistic. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. We're going, to, we're going to completely derail that statistic exactly. in the next five years, right? For sure. Great. Okay, I'm going to sit down. Uh, I've done enough damage for one evening and hand over to uh, Don. First of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight, and I want to thank the, the School of Business for asking me to be a part of this. And it's, uh, it's always special for me to come back to campus and, and spread the word about how great our University of Miami is. So I want to thank everybody for attending, and also thank you very much for having me. Uh, we'll start with uh, Coach Cristobal. And Coach, we hear you talk about a championship mindset. And share with us what that means and the sacrifices that go into and the hard work that goes into the championship mindset. Good evening. How are we doing? Great. Okay, 1982, I was at St. Teresa Junior High School. Okay, so I just wanted to say, but I did take my finals in this building as well. But again, thanks for having all of us. It's a tremendous honor uh, to be not only back home, but back here at the University of Miami as a, you know, we all know what Miami is, you know what Miami can be, you know what Miami should be all the time. And so much of that is uh, reflected by us as a football program, because in athletics, you're, you're kind of the window to the university, right? People are always looking and seeing you on TV and it gives you a, a chance to take a snapshot of what's going on. So for us, it's real simple. I mean, the principles and values of the Howard Schnellenbergers the Jimmy Johnsons, right? Um, I had Dennis Erickson as a coach as well. Is uh, to the days of working with, you know, Coach Saban up there in Alabama. He's had an interesting day, as I'm sure you guys have seen on the internet. But uh, it's as simple as how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, there shouldn't be a separation. Your DNA is what your DNA is. You are what you are 24-7. And culture is not a T-shirt or a light switch that you turn on and off when you feel like it. We're going to do everything at the highest level to the best of our abilities. So what that means is if we have a meeting, you're there 10 minutes early, prepared, ready to roll. Playbook in hand, notebook out, pencil, ready to roll. If you have a community service engagement, it's the same thing. Dress well, looking good, enthusiastic, passionate, representing the University of Miami. If you have a class, God help you if you show up late. Get there early, show the proper respect for that professor that has taken the time to prepare a lesson to help you better yourself and your path to being a future provider, a leader for your family, for your community. So it's, it's as simple as that. We don't wanna compromise a single thing because of where we are and understanding that uh, there is no entitlement. It's a privilege to be at the University of Miami and every single day we have to prove and earn the right that we deserve to be in what we like to refer to green tree practice field as sacred ground, right? Tony, how many years, how many decades, right? Mr. Williamson, how many decades of the best players in college football and in the NFL made practice so challenging, so difficult that game day was easy? Well, that approach has to overlap with everything that we do. So long answer to a short question, that's what we do. Perfect answer, I would say. Dan, um, do you want to? Dan, when you, I don't know if everybody realizes this, but you, your first job at the University of Miami, or you came in as a, as a graduate assistant in charge of the residence halls, is that right. correct? So you get a finance degree or coming out of uh, Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania uh, University, and how did, how did you go from step one to step two to step three, and now where are you today? Who were, who were your influences? Oh my gosh, so many influences in, in my career. You know, just a, a, a quick 
being here in the residence halls as a graduate assistant allowed me to do everything that I've, I've done. Uh, you know, that opportunity that the University of Miami gave me uh, to come here and get that MBA was fantastic. And I, I lived in, in uh, what used to be 960 Hall. I, I think it's Stanford or Hecht right now. I can't remember which. But my, my back door uh, opened up onto the intramural field. And I used to tell people I had the biggest backyard in Miami. I just, it was so much fun uh, to be on this campus uh, during that time and so many great people that I, that I gotten to meet. But the influencers, I mean, they're just, they're just, too, they're almost too many to name from a, a gentleman that I worked for for a number of years um, by the name of Skip Burtman. Uh, Skip Burtman was an assistant baseball coach here for Ron Fraser and was fantastic. And, and Skip uh, hired me at LSU to come in uh, after he had won five national championships in 10 years at LSU uh, when he was named the athletic director and just taught myself and so many others uh, it, how, to, how, to run, how to be a, a customer service athletic director. That the people who are investing in your program, nobody gives to your program. You don't give to the University of Miami. You invest with the University of Miami. And that mindset never left me uh, for all the years that I was in intercollegiate athletics. Uh, the, the people who give of their time, talent, and treasure are just so important to what we need to do as an athletic program and, and the university in general. So too many to name, but since we're on Miami's campus, and, and uh, actually I just got a call from Skip earlier today, so he was on my mind. He's doing wonderful for those of you uh, who know and remember him. He was, he was top of mind. Yeah, let, let, let me follow up. Um, um, do you consider college athletics a business? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, no, it, it, it's not a business. Uh, it's inside of an educational bureaucracy, and I say that lovingly on, on a college campus, uh, because if it was a business, there would only be two sports. Um, there would be football and there would be men's basketball because they are revenue generators. But we're, at our core, we're educators. So we, we look at how are we going to educate the student athletes, not in the, in the things that happen here at the, at the Herbert School, but to be able to move forward in a positive way in life, teaching them life skills and to be able to be the best that they can be. Coaches like Mario will talk about being educators and we try to do that as administrators as well. So our program is, is, is not just a business that you look at it with dollars and cents because we impact so many young people and in fact we impact communities as well and that's one of the things that I think is so so important about being here at the University of Miami. Miami is a huge town and, and the whole Dayton Broward area but the University of Miami and is just such a tiny place. It, it, it's so connected and that's what makes it so important and impactful. So Mario, I'm curious, uh, compare being a head coach of a college football team versus an NFL team. How, how would you, is, is there a difference or it's the same skill set required in both? Well, I, I don't know because I've never right, had the opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly, the way things are going with NIL, it seems like it might be similar, right? <laughs> I mean, it certainly seems like there's a salary cap out there. But I, I believe this. I believe that, that football and, and teaching and coaching, those are all vocations. They are. And how you do anything is how you do everything. It shouldn't change. You know, your principles and values should hold up whether you are. And my dad used to tell me this, all these these funny little lines on the grid that divide uh, cities and states and break up the map and countries. You know, he, he always used to tell me hard work, doing things the right way, treating people right, it transcends all those lines. So it doesn't matter if you're a coach and you're a teacher and that's your vocation, it transcends ages, demographics, leagues in this particular question. So I, I would imagine and what I've seen out there and my friends that coach in the NFL, they say it's very similar. Do, do you find it personally hard to build a culture or because you have such strong values embedded in you 
Does it just come naturally and you just naturally transmit it to everyone that you come into contact with in the, uh, in the clubhouse? Well, I mean, for us, it's a, it's a simple philosophy. Everything we do in our program is as if you are handling your very own son. It's pretty simple, right? I mean, you're not going to be perfect. We are not perfect parents, right? We, we make our mistakes and, oh man, but I'll tell you what, our intentions are pretty perfect, right? I mean, we try to do it right. We try to give every ounce that we have for the betterment of our children. Along the way, we're, you know, we're not going to be exactly perfect, but I think I love it. I mean, to me, that's the best part. I love the off season as much as anything because I, I wake up really like looking forward to what that brings where you can actually help someone see a better path have a clearer mind understand the entire vision and how it relates to their goals and understand that their goals are tied into the team goals and it all ties into the real world like this is the last pit stop right this is the final little stop before the real world right where the economy is tough right the job market is difficult the challenges are real so this is the best time of their lives, and you have them. You have them in this kind of bubble environment, so you can really just hit them with a barrage of things and principles and values and lessons that you hope they'll carry on to the rest, for the rest of their lives. Just, just one more, and then I'll hand it back to uh, Don. H how did you spend today? What did you do today? Four oh five, me, 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 me. <laughs> Alarm's going off. Uh, so then at four seventeen, out the door. Good thing a Cuban coffee got your protein shake ready to roll. Office four forty. Depends how I'm driving. Depends what songs on the radio. Whether you get the flashing red or flashing yellow. Um, <laughs> hit a quick workout. Start the recruiting process. That rolls from five fifty five all the way to about seven twenty five. Another shot of coffee, then you roll right into opponent study. Opponent study, getting with the GAs, the analysts, making sure all the coaches on the road are on schedule, that all their appointments are intact, that we've evaled everybody they're going to see. They have info on all the 23, 24, and 25 prospects. Boom, 11.30, let them take a break. Gives me a chance to make some calls to local high school coaches. Well, well I'll stop there, but then it rolls. <laughs> I'm really glad I asked that question. Coach, the day's not over when we leave here either, oh, is it? It's, it's, this is like breakfast now, you know what I mean? This is where we're getting rolling. Dan, for you, you won a national championship here with Coach Snellenberg, University of Miami. To start at that point to today, give us some of the major changes that you have seen in college football for the better. Let's just stay our, our college athletics. Sure. I'm tired after listening to Mario, <laughs> okay? So I, I need a moment here. Uh, Don, it's a great question because so many things uh, have changed in college athletics, but I think above all, the opportunity for student athletes to have a great experience uh, has, has just taken leaps and bounds, okay? Their nutrition is better. The, the mental health opportunities are better. The academic tutoring is better. The way they travel, the way they train, Everything about the student athlete's experience here is better today than it was, I don't know, even 10 years ago. Uh, because we, are, we look to make sure that those student athletes, and, and not just in football, but in all of our athletic programs, get the best opportunity to be the, be the best they can be inside their sport, but also in their chosen field of study. So I, I think that there's been a lot more investment from folks like yourself, from, in, from institutions in great facilities, in, in great coaches, and, and how our student athletes are, can continue to get better. Those are, the, those are the real investments that have changed collegiate life over the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. Mario, you, in real estate, they say it's location, location, location. I, I learned that here in this, <laughs> in, this class. in this building, right. In this, I kept hearing that again and again. So. Well, the University of Miami described its location, location, location when it comes to football and it comes to recruiting. Well, I mean, look at this event. It's like a Chamber of Commerce afternoon here at the University of Miami, right? You've got your nice breeze coming in, beautiful campus. Um, the intimate environment provided by the University of Miami, coupled with the city and all that comes with it, the energy, the culture, the diversity. 
It's so unique. I swear, when, you, when you're born and raised here and then you live here and you add on the fact that you, you had a chance, the, the unbelievable privilege of playing here, and you go away, you try to compare everything everything to Miami. It's like that first dog you had that you lost and you're like, you, the next 10 dogs you want to be just like that dog. No, it's uh, nothing compares to it. It doesn't. And, um, and you appreciate it that much more. So uh, when you get a chance to come back like this, you, you just get to appreciate it even to another level. But campus did not look like this when I was here. All right. These campus tours, I, I find myself like taking the tour myself. Going, oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> I like to come here, you know, can I say yes and commit, you know, so it's, uh, it's awesome. Dan, when you look at college football today, what would you say are the, the top three challenges? What it, for college football or college athletics is running an athletic department? Wow, only three. Um, <laughs> you know, it, there's, now I'm not going to sound like the old guy in the room right now, okay, that it used to be really really good because these are the good old days okay because I think that there's going to continue to be change within our area I mean the first thing is it takes an awful lot of resources to run an athletic program at a high level right now it always did but the numbers continue to get bigger because the revenues continue to come in from television college football is the number two uh, sport as far as viewing on television in, in the country. And television networks understand that that's a valuable commodity. So they continue to pay for that. So by universities and, and, and institutions getting those additional dollars, they continue to invest. So how long does it go? I mean, you, you, we all have blown up balloons. How much, how much air can go in that balloon before it breaks? Um, but I think that it's so important for communities, for states, for university uh, alums to keep athletic programs viable. Uh, I, I don't look at this as being something that is, uh, that is on the brink. I think athletics will always be here. Now, I will tell you that it might not look the same, okay? It may not look the same. Student athletes are going to become possibly employees of, of an institution along the way. Maybe we won't have as many sport opportunities. And I would personally be really not good with that because there are so many fantastic student athletes who have been in, in the sports that aren't football and basketball and at some universities like Miami baseball. But we will continue to evolve. Uh, and, and I don't know that anyone has that crystal ball that will show it, but college athletics will, will continue to move forward. Mario, let's get specific. Tell us about your quarterback room. Tyler Van Dyke, Garcia, the talent is, is coming and you're procuring more and more every single day. Yes, sir. We're very lucky we have a very good quarterback room. In fact, one of them is already a projected NFL player. If he continues to develop and have a great season. Uh, and again, his supporting cast will play a big role in that. And, but he's not alone. You know, you've got a guy that was hurt early last season and Jake Garcia. Uh, that him and Tyler, I mean, they've got to make the best one-two punch of any quarterback room in the country. And uh, Jake is healthy now, and they brought in Ja'Curry Brown, who joins us as the most prolific passer and really winner in Georgia, I think, high school history for the amount of games that he won. A, a phenomenal athlete and human being, high-level student, uh, who joins these guys. Got here early, early enrollee, which is always fun, right? It's like getting dropped off in, <laughs> in some place, you know, it's, uh, when you get to have to get to learn to know everybody and know processes. The simplicity of a, attaining a cane card is as difficult as you can imagine, but Ja'Curi is, is really, um, he's adapted really well and he is ready to roll, so we feel great about that room. Dan, the bowl system, uh, where, do you see, where do you see that going? We've got Orange Bowl people, in the audience today from, from the committee and can you forecast anything in that arena? I would have been wrong because I thought the college football playoff would have expanded uh, with two years left on its contract and it didn't. Uh, so we're going to run through the contract the last couple of years um, but in 2026, the 2026 season 
uh, we'll move forward with an expanded uh, college football playoff. Uh, there's interest there. The television networks want it. Uh, by that point in time, I think we will have uh, answered any of the questions that had come forward over the last um, five or six months from, from conference commissioners as to health and safety and calendar and all of those things that, that were put, put forward. But I think that the college football playoff has been great uh, with four teams. Uh, it is uh, really, if you look back in history, you had the, the Bowl Alliance, you had the Bowl Coalition, you had the BCS, now you had the CFP at four. The next iteration is gonna be the CFP at, at, at probably 12. Uh, so I think that will uh, give more student athletes the opportunity to participate in a playoff, oper playoff environment. Uh, there's still some calendar issues that we have to work through, but we'll definitely get there and uh, college football will, will continue to grow. Um, so, Mar Mario, I had a couple of questions. One, one is, could you tell us a couple of stories about young players who uh, maybe were not performing up to expectations and how you helped uh, turn, turn them around? Do you really want to hear this? <laughs> It's well, a mean, family best, show. It's a family show. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the best form of motivation is competition, right? I mean, we have a saying around here: it's, it's get on edge and stay on edge. And if if someone is ever too comfortable in their role, knowing that there's no one pushing them, that they have absolutely no fear of losing their job, well, it's it doesn't really bring out the best in them because, you know, right now it's kind of simple. You have a scholarship. So whether you have a good day or a bad day, when you go to the, the chow hall after practice, your scholarship is still good. Your meal card still works. And the next day might be an average day, but your, your tuition is still paid for. You know, and you're, you're part of this beautiful lakeside village. You're still, you know, you still have your accommodations. Well, at the next level, if you have a bad day, when you try to go to the, the chow line, the, the lunch hall, you try to swipe that card, there's somebody there waiting for you. Give me your playbook and your card. Bye-bye, you're cut. So, the best way to prepare them for real competition and real world scenarios is just to provide competition. Always crank up the level of and the caliber of human being and competitive character of your football team. If you do that, they'll find a way to stay on edge and you'll get the best out of everybody. Whether they start or not, you'll get the best out of everybody. But we always, we're, we're a feedback operation, right? Because everybody wants what? Everybody wants to be recognized, they want feedback, and if they're doing well, they want to be rewarded. They want praise. We believe in that. That's huge. It's critical in helping someone develop. But the key for us is always keeping it turned up. How do you uh, give feedback to the team after it wins versus after it loses? Well, you're, you're honest. I think all the questions when, regarding a team and culture is all comes back to honesty and transparency. Because you know what? When you win or you lose, Let's, let's get right to it. If it's not good enough, right? If you did something poorly when you lost, it's not good enough. Well, if you do the same thing but you win a game, it still shouldn't be good enough, right? How you do anything is how you do everything. There's a certain standard, right? You've got to walk a certain way and, and go to class a certain way and practice and train and eat a certain way to be able to play a certain way. And some things are just not acceptable and they shouldn't be tolerated. And the culture must establish a level or anything that hurts the culture cannot and will not be tolerated, you know? And if it can't be met, that our players are geared and dedicated to bringing guys up with them, yeah. right? And so that's the way we approach it. How important is momentum? In college football, it's, it's huge. It's, it's a great question. The pros, they're pros. You know, those are older guys, you know? They, they've seen it all. Young guys, whoa, I mean, Society, I mean, I, I, come on now, we, I've got this phone in my pocket, I could access anything. I could tell you about iguanas in Cambodia right now if you ask me, right? But we used to have to get on a bike, pedal to the library, get off, go to the card catalog, find a call number, go to the aisle, pull it out, oh, it's not there, microfilm, doesn't exist, it's on order, two weeks it'll be here, right? So it's the, this world of instantaneous, you know, uh, gratification and feedback, it's, it's different. So for us, the mindset, we related all back to working and earning. There's, there, had a, there was a saying in uh, New England that Tom Brady um, 
talked about as it relates to Bill Belichick, you know, Tom Brady throws an interception in preseason, preseason game. And he thinks he's going to just kind of coast through the film session. But Bill Belichick just tears into him. I mean, he lights him up in front of all the rookies, the entire team. And, and Tom Brady approaches him and says, Coach, well, you know, what's that all about, man? I'm a vet. I've been here a while. I've proven myself. And he said, let me tell you something. For this culture, there are no sacred cows, okay? Everybody's accountable. Everybody's accountable to each other. And if you ever strip this culture of accountability, then the entire culture will go downhill. So I thought that was pretty neat. We've adopted a lot of those principles. Super. So we're, we're going to open it up to uh, questions from uh, you guys. Um, so I think we've got a few mics uh, available. Can we uh, just get those lined up, uh, please? That would be great. Um, Dan, uh, just while we're doing that, um, and people are thinking up uh, a couple of questions for you, um, what, what, what do you see as the biggest personal challenge in coming back here uh, to, the, uh, to the U? You know, I think that any time you come into a new situation, one of the things you have to do is understand the culture of, of the community and, and here at the university. I, I've worked at six different places and they, they all had different cultures. So to be able to be successful, you have to be able to communicate amongst all those different cultures. So that's really what the, the first five or six months have been, not only getting to know our coaches and our student athletes, but getting to know the University of Miami again and, and how with some of the changes and the things we want to do, how best to go about moving through the culture to be able to convince uh, the decision makers this is the proper thing that we need to do to get this intended result. So we've seen it. We, Mario's done it at a few places he's been. I've done it at a few places. But Miami hasn't done it. So how do we convince Miami this is the right thing to do? Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge and something that is, uh, it's actually a lot of fun because you get to meet some really great people along the way. Okay. Um, just, to, just to follow up briefly, are you implying that as an aspiring research university, uh, there's more of a challenge now than there was when you were here before in terms of the, the role and importance of sports versus other objectives of the, uh, the institutional mission. No, I don't know that I'd ever go that far. You know, at, at the end of the day, we're educators. And the University of Miami is, is an educational institution. It's a research institution that has an athletics problem. Okay, we love athletics. Athletics is a part of who we are. The brand of the U is known far and wide. We have to be able to continue to move that forward. Okay, uh, just as Mario talks about not resting on the laurels and, and keeping the players on edge, um, all of us who represent the university have to understand the, the brand of the U needs to continue to grow. And we're all ambassadors for that. And athletics can be, ath athletics can be the igniter uh, for that. And that's really what, what we want to be able to have happen. All right, great. I'm, I'm sure the rest of you have experienced this, but uh, you know, when I came down to uh, Miami from uh, Boston in 2017, I didn't really appreciate what uh, you have just uh, been talking about. And um, uh, I put this little pin on and uh, started getting on airplanes and going around the country. And uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how many people recognize what this is and uh, especially doormen in New York hotels. You know, they, they expect a big tip if they recognize what uh, that pin is on your uh, lapel. All right, let's open it up for uh, some questions. Uh, uh, give it your best shot, guys. Um, we've got two of the finest here. We want to uh, do everything to uh, make it fun and not disappoint them. So give, uh, put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you. Ed, up front. Caitlin, right in front of you. Uh, Mario and Dan, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, Dan, I'm, I'm curious. I'm hearing a little bit about uh, what might be the fate of the divisional uh, uh, makeup of our conference right now. Uh, A, is that going to go away? And if it does, what is that going to mean to the University of Miami? Well, thank you, Ed, and, and appreciate everything you do for Mario, myself, and, and intercollegiate athletics here at Miami. Uh, just fantastic. 
you know, one of the things that we're looking at as a group of athletic directors is how do we put our best foot forward uh, from a television perspective, from getting the teams into the college football playoffs. So we've had extensive discussions about eliminating the divisions, going to one, uh, one through 14, and having three permanent opponents and playing other teams uh, twice, home and away, over a four-year period. The, the uh, derivation of that came from the knowledge that we've had student athletes who've, who don't make a, a rotation around the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, that's not what we want to do. We want to give our student athletes the opportunity to play everybody in the league. Uh, and our fans the opportunity to kind of travel throughout the league as well. So we're, in, we're, not, we're closer to the end than the beginning with that study. Um, and I would think that probably by the end of, uh, the, end of the summer, we could have a, 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 an understanding as to where we're going to go for the 2023 season. Great. Ne next question. Angel behind uh, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, both of you mentioned coming back and how this place looks different, the facilities and everything. So could you both outline your wish in terms of how you see facilities evolving to meet the needs of the future program? So, you know, football stadium, other types of competitive things that will get, continue to give the U a competitive advantage. Well, I, on behalf of the, the football program, I'm talking about a football facility. In going away, um, immediately you recognize the competitive advantage that other programs have established. It seems like back in the 80s and 90s that Miami had created separation because it was an even playing field. Facilities were starting to come about across the country, but nothing like was about to happen from 2000 all the way up until now. I mean, at the University of Oregon, I, I worked in the Death Star. It looked like something out of Star Wars. You know, recovery centers where you can walk in there dead tired and walk out, you know, 5% leaner and, you know, with a 50 pound stronger bench. Um, every, every detail of all process would be the academic center, uh, the nutritional center, the strength and conditioning department, the machinery that comes with it, the sports psychology department, uh, the professional development opportunities, and then the flat out facility, where you train, where the football team lives, because that's where you're at. You're there six to seven days a week, us as coaches, seven days a week, players six, 18 to 20 hours out of the day. And the gap between Miami and the other programs was monstrous. It really was. And I first noticed it um, when I was at the University of Alabama. And you know, it's a little bit of a painful job because you do have to recruit, you know, down here in South Florida. And the common theme in recruiting was that, well, coach, you know, I like you guys. I like so-and-so school. I like Miami but Miami doesn't have the facilities or Miami doesn't invest the resources. So I'm probably going to go away, you know? So that's why, and it, it rings true in it because when you're a parent, you want to see a place that's invested. And the best way to show that is by investing in the re you know, using resources to enhance the development of the student athletes. The university made a great investment a few years ago in Lakeside Village. And the next one it's going to be is Centennial uh, the Centennial Commons area. What that does for the moms and dads who are here for, for their non-student athlete students is the university cares about our student. So if you just take that whole idea to the athletic area, so the moms and the dads and the students, like Mario just said, come onto our campus and they say, wow, is the university, do they really care about athletics? Um, and that's what we have to change. We have to create the forever home the forever home of University of Miami football. And we need to do that in a magnificent way so that the, the student athletes and the parents understand that football is important here, it's a part of our culture, and that we're gonna do it the right way and we're gonna, we're gonna make them better while they're here. You'd like to have a stadium next door? I would much rather, no, I'm not going to, Mario and I don't script this stuff, by the way, so he may have a different opinion, but I think it's really important. We have a wonderful place up at Hard Rock Stadium to play football. It's a professional football um, facility. Don't go there today. There's a tennis facility right in the middle of it that they haven't taken down yet, but it is a wonderful place to play. The forever home where we take care and feed the needs of the student athlete 
358 days a year as opposed to just seven is so, so important. Um, you know, because, you know, when you're even, even when you have the stadium right next door, you've got to go on the road five or six times a year to play, play games anyway. So that's what's most important to, to me right now, I, I, uh, to be able to get that done and, and really leave it an imprint on, on the University of Miami. More questions? All right, go ahead. Let's go to the back and uh, get some of those uh, folks involved. Hello. Thank you for doing this. Um, I was interested in knowing how you guys feel regarding the NIL. It's obviously something that has been very, very good for us, but I feel like it's corrupting college football in a way. And I'm interested in knowing how you think that it's all going to shake out eventually in the next two to three years. And how do you personally feel about it? Well, I think there's, you almost need like a couple years of, you need a cohort, right? You need a sample size. And I don't think we have it yet. I, I know the way that it's done or has been done for the student athletes that are represented. Um, and anything involving the University of Miami has been done the right way and above board. Um, it's hard to comment on it because we're not directly involved. And there aren't any real regulations or sideboards to it. So it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, it really is. I remember being a student athlete and was hoping I could have a, enough money to get a pizza and a t-shirt. I mean, we won a few games, right? Uh, this, is a, this is a little bit different, so I don't know if, uh, I mean, I'm for the student athletes being able to profit. What that means, I don't know what that means as it relates to this model. It's too difficult for anybody to wrap their heads around because you really, there aren't enough specifics to the direction in which it's going, which we're hoping for guidelines here in the near future. So I haven't answered your question. So I, I understand that. <laughs> I'm just saying right now, it's a different time. I'm for the concept. I just, I don't know if we have a firmed up, like true model, sideboards, regulations, stipulations, whatever it may be that allow us to really completely understand it and comment on it. Ask us that in about two and a half, three years. And Mario is exactly right. The sample size is too small. Um, we, we don't exactly know where all this is gonna go. I mean, most of us are free market economists and you know, we are capitalists at heart. Um, but what that also brings to you are market corrections. Um, and I don't, you know, are, are people going to continue to invest in the student athletes? I don't know because most of the people who are doing that are really great business people. And they got to be great business people by investing in the right way. So a couple more years down the road, we'll give you a much better answer. All right, thank you. Let's, uh, let's see if there are, I think we've got time for a couple more uh, before uh, uh, going to refreshments. Uh, yes, on my left. Hello, thank you for hosting the event. I'd like to know, uh, for the fans, it's easy to have expectations based on the, play, on the record that you have on the field, but I'd like to understand a little bit more about your work that you have right now. For the next year, as you're rebuilding and really establishing the framework of how you're successful you're gonna be, could you talk a, lo a little bit about what those expectations and what those goals ha you have that maybe are not known to the outside world? Sure, for us, the expectation is doing the absolute best that you possibly can. It's that simple. There has to be improvement, and improvement comes in the form of, number one, discipline, right? We're the most penalized team in the country last year, one of the most penalized, like in the 120s out of 132 collegiate football teams. Our, our rushing attack was, I believe, 112th or something of that nature. The passing attack was very good, really good. Um, so if you look at everything from special teams, punt coverage, kickoff coverage, if you look at the details of when you were getting penalized, because some of them are you know, the simplicity of jumping off sides when you shouldn't and the team gets a first down. Or sometimes it's a roughing the passer or a personal foul that sustains a drive that ends up costing the entire game. Those things are important. A lot of times more games are lost than they are won. So when you bring a culture together and you bring all these alphas together that are always, right? What do alphas do? Alphas just bump heads, right? They want conflict. I'm okay with that. You just got to make sure that these alphas start galvanizing this football team and start 
looking for conflict for the guys on the other side of the field, the other locker room. That's where the enemy's at. And then getting guys to understand the importance of that, all these personal goals that they have, they're tied into the team goals as well. A lot of guys want to go to the NFL. Well, the NFL does not like drafting guys from teams that don't win very much. Right? These things go hand in hand. Success feeds upon itself and breeds more success, and high achievers want to be around high achievers. This, football is going to, this football team is going to be much improved, and we have a very ambitious schedule. We play road games at College Station in front of 112,000 people. I've been there before. You can't even hear yourself think, you know? We got to get on the road and go to from Virginia, where it's going to be about 20 degrees and raining sideways, to Clemson, where it's going to have a, you know, 88, 90,000 people that are going absolutely bananas. And between now and then, our motivation and preparation are going to be the difference. Our motivation has to be internal. We've got to build this thing from the inside out so that we're in a phase, whether we walk into a stadium with five people or 500,000. The line of scrimmage is a humongous point of emphasis because you know how football works well when you're knocking the other team back the other way. If they're knocking you back this way, well, typically things don't go very well and the scoreboard doesn't read to your favor. So it's getting on edge and staying on edge. It's making sure we understand that no bad play, no bad call, no injury. There's nothing that we can't overcome because the tougher it gets, the better we play. The harder it gets, the better we become. We do that, our goal of 1-0 every single week, we should always have a chance to accomplish that. All right, last, last one. I think we've got one more at the uh, rear there. Great. I'll just move over here so you can actually see me. Hi, my name's Sammy. Um, just a quick question. Um, in terms of NIL, um, does the athletics department currently have any programs or sort of education for student athletes to better advocate for themselves in NIL deals? And if not, is there any plan in the future to have that sort of education be available to them? Yeah, right now, because of the Florida law, we really can't be involved in some of the acquisition of NIL opportunities for student athletes. But what we do do, and, and we do a lot of it, is educate our athletes on opportunities that may be there and, and help educate them about things such as, uh, if you have NIL opportunities, you need to pay taxes. Uh, you, the IRS is undefeated, okay? <laughs> so we have to let the student athletes know when they get these opportunities, they've gotta be able to pay their taxes. So those types of things, and, and if you're doing well, how do you uh, take some of those dollars and help set yourself up? Because as we talked about, 90, 9% of our student athletes will not play professionally uh, in their sport. So if they have NIL opportunities right now, how can they take that, whatever it ends up being, and help set themselves up for when they get, as Mario talked about, into the real world, okay? Use this time right now. You're actually starting to, to move forward and, 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 and start to save money earlier. The two young women who have committed to our women's basketball program, the Cavender Twins, who are currently still at, at Fresno, um, they are entrepreneurs of the highest level. Yes, they're gonna come here and they're gonna be in our business school, um, but they have lived an internship like no other. They will leave here with a business degree, but they will also leave here with the idea of how to run a business. Something that everyone had to learn once they left here, okay? They know that, and many of our other student athletes will get to know that as well. That's the beauty of being, uh, of NIL. There's gonna be people who learn how to be entrepreneurs, and that's gonna be a real positive. Don, a few last words. Yeah. Well, that will wrap up our Riverside chat this evening, not, not, not the fireside. I, I wanna, once again, thank everybody for, for joining us. Dean, thank you for making this possible. Dan and Mario, we appreciate your attendance. And more importantly, I want to thank the people in the audience. I see David Lieberman, who has been here forever, and I think his number was he was a part of 59 buildings, or 49, was it 59 buildings? 
uh, in in including the one that we're here. And I think one thing we always want to leave with and remember as hurricanes is that it takes all of us. It takes all of us. We're not going to win in the School of Business if we're not all involved. We're not going to win in football if we're not all involved. We're not going to win in basketball or baseball or softball or whatever it may be. So I really think that in your heart, always remember that if you do a little or you do a lot, just do the most you can do to support this program and this university. Support the business schools, support everything that there is. Because I really believe that with these student athletes and the students that are at this university, we're saving lives. And we're giving young people the direction that they would never have if they weren't here. And I promise you, if you, we ever have the time and you get to talk to the, the student athletes, because that's where I spent my time with, you'll find out that you saved their lives and gave them a direction. So again, do the best you can do and defend this program and defend this university. Win, lose, or draw, it's ours. And I think you can't ever forget that. It's ours and there's been a lot of people pouring a lot into it for years and decades and decades. So again, thank you for having us here again, Dean. We appreciate it. And go Canes, right? There's nothing better than that. All right. Well, th thanks very much, uh, Don. I uh, really appreciate it, Mario and Dan. You know, one, one thing I want to point out in uh, the spirit of what you just said is no other school in this university contributes more to athletics than the alumni of uh, the business school. And uh, we're, we're really proud uh, to do that. Eddie, are you shaking your head and saying I'm wrong or not? Right, that's, that's the correct answer. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, I just want to say in addition that we have two people here, uh, Orestes Hernandez, uh, who yes. really organized this event. Thank you very much, Orestes. And uh, of course, uh, the indomitable Blanca Rapol, who has uh, organized everything through all of COVID and uh, has a few small tokens of appreciation for uh, Don, Dan, and Mario. Please come on up and make the presentation. And Mario. Well, I was gonna say, number one, thank you for having us here. I mean, it's, it's always an honor. Uh, and it's surreal to be back home. It really is. I mean, walking these hallways a little while back, being a graduate assistant. Who's, who's been a graduate assistant before? I mean, come on now. I mean, you're, the stack on your desk gets so high, it never gets resolved. You're here till two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you fall asleep at your desk. It is an absolute incredible dream and an honor to be back here. So we're investing our entire existence into everything regarding the University of Miami. Everything. So if, if you guys ever get some free time, okay, um, I'd like to invite you to practice. I really want you to see the level of intensity, physicality, just flat out bringing it. And how you can see how we treat every opportunity and that field on Greenwich like sacred ground. Um, that being said, I had the top 2024 player in the country like waiting in my office. <laughs> and his buddy is one of the best for 2023. So to be able to come back here with big smiles, I want to get these guys. <laughs> so I'm going to have to excuse myself go and get on that cart and go see them before they go. Uh, but before I do, again, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go Canes all day, all night, every day. Let's go. Yeah.